So what I will do, uh, David, and for of course for the rest, uh, is uh, to present uh, a very few minutes to set the scene. And then uh, from what I've understood from Roshan is that we'll make a small presentation of each one of you and then give you five minutes. So uh, those who want to go early can start earlier because I'm, I was uh, uh, given the kind of the green light to go alphabetically. So I'll make the presentation alphabetically. And I think Nina, is that right, Nina? Yes. Uh, yes. So you can start earlier, and so that we then we can have your views, and then we'll, t we'll we'll start with the rest. Is that okay with everyone? Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so right. much for the flexibility. Okay. Good. So, so as soon as Rovshan gives a green light, then we can start. So do we need to introduce ourselves? I, I'll do the introduction quickly myself. I've got the okay. names and everything, and then based on and then of course the, then I will give the floor so you can start first. Uh, and how many minutes do we have? Is there uh, five, five minutes? Five, five minutes. minutes. Yes, five minutes. Um, uh, the, the topic. Okay. Well, I will, in the course of my presentation, I will touch on some of the topics which you can pick up and uh, give your views on this. Is that right? Is that okay? Oh, that's yeah. okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um. Okay, well, uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I would like to first um, thank you for, for inviting me to this panel. It's an enormous pleasure to see some of you again. I was first in Baku in the Nazami Ganjava International Center conference in 2017, so almost three years ago. And uh, I met some of you uh, there for the first time, including Roshan Swati, Ivan, Newton Davis, and so forth. So please, um, uh, warm regards to all of you and to some of you, hello for the first time. Uh, so uh, my name is Nina Vujanovic, I'm from Montenegro, and currently I'm residing in Switzerland, in Geneva, where I've been in consultant in UNCTAD, in United Nations, for past seven months. So ever since November 2019, uh, uh, my, my, my task has been to update the forecasting model on foreign direct investment and also the use uh, that uh, the forecasting model for the prognosis of FDI inflows globally uh, in 2020, which was quite a challenge because of the pandemic, but uh, we all been through it. Um, so um, I can use this, uh, this opportunity, if you allow me, to give you some of the forecasts of foreign direct investment because the World Investment yeah. Report... Nina, Nina can, I, can I make the introduction and then you can pick up from there? Okay, that's good, because I thought yes. that uh, I should start... No, no, no. I, I was waiting for uh, Rovshan, but I think I can, I can start. Okay, let me, let me introduce, and then you can immediately, when I finish making the introduction, then okay. you can present, okay? I just need to repeat all of this. Yes, no problem. Okay. <laughs> well, Sorry. I'm going to be bored. Yes. yes, There you go. Well, thank Rovshan, can we, can we start? Okay, I thought I'll start, right? So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to this panel that has been graciously put together by the Nizami Ganjavi International Center. So, what uh, I think we, how we will do the, in, the, in the course of our conversation is uh, to go through some of the events that have uh, really defined the beginning of 2020, but more so. Uh, post-COVID, during COVID, what has happened, and of course, how do we emerge? So the past few months that we all agree have been beyond eventful on this planet of ours. A small, non-living organism has changed our lives, have made it upside down, and I'm sure for generations to come, we will feel the effects of the coronavirus. 
So COVID-19 has not only revealed the state of our institutions, their preparedness or unpreparedness, but also helped or open up a whole suite of issues that we have almost taken for granted. We have taken for granted that media, for example, will give us the information that we can trust, and we have witnessed a flurry of fake news on social media. COVID-19 has also tested the leadership of many and has seen a new form of leadership emerging, one that can be defined as compassionate, credible, honest, feminine, and with a strong underpinning of science. COVID has also given us some difficult choices. How much privacy are we, allow, are we willing to sacrifice for the common good? So as I have a panel of young people, I think it'd be good to have your take on these burning issues. The rise of nationalism, do we agree on an activistic agenda? What is your take on the movement that has risen in the, in the, from the United States that is now spreading across the world, the Black Lives Matter movement? The BLM movement, as we increasing call, is a call to action to address issues like inequality and inequities in our legal systems, which deprive of us of so many of our fundamental rights, like access to an education, civic rights, amongst others. So what will be the consequences of the BLF movement? Also, as we have seen, a call to remove, for example, monuments, and uh, which to many are reminders of crimes committed in the bygone era. So I have the great pleasure of welcoming our panelists today. So we have David Benger, research fellow, Harvard University, and he, he holds a BA from Brandeis University, MS Schwarzman College, Tsinghua University, JD Harvard Law School. We have Newton Davis, venture capitalist at Beyond 1435, holds a BA from the William College, MSC Schwarzman College, Tsinghua University. Jared Fisher, founder and managing director of the Y11 consulting firm in Chicago. Ivan Ivanov, professor international from the Balkan University. Rachel Long, medical doctor, MBCHB Chinese University, Hong Kong. John Redos, Blair Academy, with a BS in Cor from Cornell and MS MSc from Oxford. Emil Skandal, Principal, Capital Foundry, Technology Columnist. Swati Sureka, National Science Foundation of the United States, of course, a BA from Cornell, MSc Edinburgh, and MSc Oxford. So with this great panel, we are, we are, well, I am at least hoping for a fantastic interaction. But before we go, I've missed somebody. Have I missed Nina? I think I've missed Nina. I don't have your name here on the list. But anyway, Nina, please start with uh, your uh, view on what I have just discussed. And what is your institution, UNCTAD, for example, trying uh, to do post-COVID and how we emerge into this new world we are being born into? And let us have your take on this, Nina. Thank you very much for a lovely introduction. Uh, well, I've been uh, residing in Geneva for past uh, seven months, working for UNCTAD on a project that is related on the forecast of foreign direct investment. So basically I was updating the model on forecasting of foreign direct investments globally. And uh, I've used, uh, my task has also been to do the forecast of for foreign direct investment inflows uh, in 2020, 21, and 2022 for the purpose of the World Investment Report, which is the one of the major UN reports on the uh, uh, FDI. Uh, so I'll just um, use this opportunity to, to basically also just give a note on, on, on this report because much of the World Investment Report in 2020 is dealing about the life uh, beyond the pandemic. Uh, so basically what is going to happen with the international production and investments after the pandemic. And um, so um, I'll just briefly start with uh, saying that the forecast of FDI is very negative for 2020 because of the pandemic, we are going to have the unprecedented decline of foreign direct investment in 2020. And by the model and the expert judgment, it has been uh, forecasted that uh, FDI will decline by 40%. Uh, so basically, this is going to be uh, the biggest decline, even much bigger than the one that foreign direct investment experienced uh, in the uh, financial crisis. Uh, and uh, 
EC is uh, forecast that uh, the FDI inflow globally will be below one trillion uh, dollars, US dollars, which is the first time happening after to 2005. So almost after two thousand. So the level of FDI will be at the level we had 15 years ago due to pandemic. So as you can see, there is going to be an enormous impact on international production, on cross-border investment. And already the data uh, in Wuhan show that uh, there is a, uh, a huge decline in uh, uh, cross-border merger and acquisition announcement, but also greenfield project taking place. So the, 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 these results are, and forecasts are based on the expert judgment and the model, but the data that we have now already shown that this is very likely to be the case. Uh, now, even uh, in 2021, it is forecasted that there will be a slight decline on foreign direct investment uh, globally, up to 10%. And foreign direct investment or international production uh, will start picking up in 2022. Now, to what extent? It's very ambiguous and that really the outlook is highly uncertain and prospects mainly depend on the duration of the health, health crisis, on the effectiveness of policy interventions to mitigate the economic effects of this terrible pandemic. But um, it's, to me, it's, for an economic perspective, it's very interesting to notice that uh, unlike trade, which has been forecasted by World Trade Organization, have a V-shape of recovery. So large decline in 2020, but large in, um, recovery or rebound in 2021. FDI is going to have a U shape of recovery as forecasted by World Investment Board. So large decline in 2020, modest decline in 2021, and then the rebound taking place in 2022. Now, to what do we are we really going to have a rebound, which basically implies a full recovery or moving to the trend that we had before the pandemic? That's really highly uncertain, and it. Um, only in the most optimistic scenario in 2022, we will go to the pre-pandemic FDI info trend. So uh, as you can see, the pandemic has struck us all and this decline is not going to be the same across all countries. Latin America has been forecasted to have half of the investment it had in 2019. So investment will be declined by 50%. While more uh, developed economies will also uh, experience a, a large decline, like Europe up to 45% and North America up to 35%, but to a lower extent than developing economies. Again, this is some trends that economic, are very economically intuitive. Developing world suffers always more than developed economy because we have uh, less of a robust economies. I'm saying we because uh, most of us are here are from transition economies, uh, which are closer to developing world or somewhere in between developed and developing world. So you see that there are going to be some diversion in, of the investment activities um, across the globe, uh, which has been something we, 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 we expected. Now I can also speak about, because much of the World Investment Report has been eventually dedicated to the effect of technologies on the future production. Because what this pandemic has shown is that technology has had an enormous impact on how we conduct activities. We can still be as efficient as we were before the pandemics, thanks to technologies taking place. So uh, my personal take, this is not something that has been published in the WRR, but is that um, we're going to see a uh, reallocation of um, uh, sectoral activities toward those activities that employ technology to a larger extent. Um, so please do interrupt me if, if I'm taking too much time because I think I'll be speaking for over five minutes. But uh, um, much of... I'm sorry, but I don't hear you. Just quickly give us some of your views on the other, on the other which we touched on, uh, like media, social media, fake news, and what, what is your take on this so that we can... Uh, my, uh, my take is that uh, media has, has, has enormous power in how we form the expectations. Uh, so I said, I, I, 
well, well, just speaking from, because I work in the, the division on investment and enterprise, and my focus is really investment. For investor, it's all about whether he will invest somewhere in the future. It really depends on the information an investor holds. So if, if the information is untrue, it will disrupt investment to some, to some extent. So the truthful information is, is, has always been the core. And I would say that the pandemic has, has, has really shown that, uh, um, ha, has proven, in a way proven this hypothesis. Um, false information can, can, can cause a huge anxiety in, in a human being. But to talking globally, uh, they, 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 they are going to, to disrupt the system if, 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 if they are untrue, at least in short run, because in long run, I think uh, the, the truth always comes out. So my take is that uh, media plays a crucial role in, in uh, addressing issues, but it's also very important to know, to highlight how it addresses the issue. So because valid information is nowadays, as it says, it's a fortune, it's money, and it's, in, and it's important. So my, my take is that media should take this this role responsibly. And I think pandemic has clearly shown that. Well, one thing I just quickly get your views on this because I know you have to go, is uh, you've mentioned that uh, the level of FDI in, de in developing countries is going to go down. Uh, what is uh, your, there is increasingly uh, this fear of reshoring of many of the companies. Do you see that happening in the near future or that will be for much later? And it will all depend, of course, on the uptake of technology in many of these developing regions, as you, as you rightly mentioned. Well, uh, uh, FDI will, uh, will uh, go down globally, but I said in developing econ economies a lot more. Why? Because the investment is not as diversified in developing economies. For instance, in Latin America, much of the investment goes in certain industries that are highly oil dependent because oil prices has been massively affected by the pandemic. Uh, there is going to be, it's expected there is going to be a huge decline in this sector. So much of the investment, much of what is happening in the future will be sector specifics. And those economies having less diversified economy will suffer more because they depend on few sectors. And that's, that's the case, for instance, for, for Latin America in particular. Uh, and uh, uh, as for the future and how the future will unfold for the investment and international production in general, uh, much of that is written in the uh, World Investment Report in chapter four. And one uh, chapter has, and section has been particularly dedicated to technologies. So uh, in, it has been said that uh, there are uh, three types of technological trends that are going to mass to affect uh, international production in the future. So the first one is digitalization, which highly affects uh, a supply chain. Then automation of activities, which is driven by robotics and artificial intelligence. And the third one is 3D printing, which is an additive manufacturing. Uh, well, all of these technological trends in the future will affect the length geographical distribution and governance of the global value chain. And I would like to highlight one once more that many of these technological trends are also highly sector specific. That also means again that those economies that are profiled in some sectors that are um, being more and more digitalized or technologically advanced, going to be more technologically advanced in the future will probably go through this transformation faster than other economies. So for instance, digitalization uh, is uh, basically encompasses uh, frontier of internet-based technologies, such as Internet of Things, the cloud augmented and uh, virtual reality, and also platform-based technologies such as e-commerce, fine tech, and blockchain. Well, you see, th these, th this digitalization is taking, that is taking place is mostly service specifics. So industries that are providing services have experienced to a larger extent this modernization of technology, digitalization, whereas manufacturing that is more of a traditional sector has experienced digitalization to, to a lower extent. And only components of the manufacturing production that include services have been transformed in such uh, um, 
in such fashion, and that's so-called servicization of, of technology. But on the other hand, um, automatization of, of, of activities uh, has been also industry specific, but has been more inclined, we were more inclined to see automation of activities in manufacturing industries, such as automobile industries or electronics. So these industries are more likely to grow quickly in this fashion, in, the, in, in, in um, their, their activities are more likely to be advanced due to robotics than some activities that are uh, service related, that provide some service activities. Uh, so much of this, these activities really, uh, 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 technologies that uh, are going to transform the international production are really service specific. Um, there is also 3D printing technology. Can you just quickly sum up so that we can have a uh, space for, for, for the others? Oh, well. yes. Thank so you. basically uh, what we are going to see according to the World Investment Report uh, is a huge decline in the FDI in 2020 and a very slow recovery and much of the international production in the future will be, uh, is expected to be affected by digital economy and, and technology taking place. My, my, my opinion is that uh, uh, these technologies uh, and, and transformation of um, production will be affect differently, different parts of the world, depending on the level of development, because not all countries conduct uh, the most sophisticated innovative activities. Not all countries are technologically advanced. Countries that are developed and, and the, uh, at the frontier of the, the technological development conduct R&D, but those countries that are at the lower bottom uh, do not. So technological advancement will uh, certainly differently affect different sectors and different economies, and it will be interesting to see how. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nina. Thank, Thank you. you very much for your, for, your, for your input in this discussion. So we'll now go on to David. David, five minutes, and then we can have a much uh, broader, of course, uh, uh, more enriching discussion after you speak, I'm sure. David, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, thank you so much uh, for that, President Garib Fakim, and thank you, Nina, for that very enlightening short talk you gave us. That was, that was very helpful. Um, I, I want to talk briefly about kind of the interplay between um, the media and the fake news narrative, um, as well as sort of the discussions happening around um, nationalism and uh, so I'm American and we have obviously the election coming up in November which everyone's thinking about um, and I, so I just kind of want to begin with a case study which I thought was quite interesting um, so it's sort of widely believed and kind of accepted that uh, Russia to one degree or another tried to interfere with the election in 2016 uh, the degree to which that had an impact on actual votes at the end of the day is um, still disputed but it's sort of understood that through various technological um, tools, this, this was an attempt made by the Russian government to have an impact on the US elections. Now, um, a couple of days ago, President Trump held a rally in Tulsa, Oklahoma, under the impression he and his campaign team expected nearly a million people to show up there. And uh, it is sort of several reputable news sources are reporting that the reason that the campaign expected this turnout is because a group of teenagers uh, using various social media apps um, had reserved hundreds and thousands of tickets to this event without ever having any intention of showing up. Um, so in preparation for the event, they set up a separate outdoor stage because they expected there to be overflow um, and were subsequently embarrassed because they had sort of, I think 6,000 people or so show up in the end. Um, and there's now being a parallel drawn um, by people by, by people and news organizations and social media commentators who are supporters of Donald Trump who say that this social media campaign, which is largely operated on an app called TikTok, which is owned by the Chinese, um, was sort of the similar kind of the parallel effort to what the Russian government did in 2016 is now the Chinese government is doing for the 2020 election, um, which of, cur of course, uh, you know, is just completely off the base. Um, it has nothing to do with the reality on the ground. I mean, granted, a lot of the a lot of the teenagers um, who supposedly allegedly took part in this uh, were not American. Uh, many of them European or from other parts of the world. 
Um, but there's no evidence, no reason to suggest that this was a coordinated um, a movement by any single government, much less the Chinese government, even though the app on which it was done uh, was owned by the Chinese. And yet this narrative is being propagated that in fact, this is the same thing, their side has done the same thing that they've accused us of doing, et cetera. Um, and I think this idea of throwing any theory at the wall and hoping that it sticks um, is, is pretty new um, and, or at least in the American context, has not been done with such audacity um, in decades. Um, and the problem is that it is really gaining traction. Um, and I, I think this, this question that uh, we were discussing earlier about fake news and about trusting traditional media sources, President Trump has been going on about how one should not trust traditional media sources for almost a full decade now. Um, and he's had ad hominem attacks against uh, CNN anchors and New York Times reporters and those institutions at large. And he claims um, increasingly that even Fox News, which has traditionally been a more Republican supporting news agency, has gone too far to the left. And instead, he has even floated the idea of creating a government run, government sponsored news agency that um, presumably would be more loyal to him while he was in office. Um, so the kind of marketplace of ideas in uh, in the journalism forum which we have become accustomed to in the united states is being challenged by um kind of this plurality of of uh, th this idea that whoever shouts the loudest may be heard the most rather than who does the deepest research or who has the best reputation for facts um and i think i think that's really problematic and really quite dangerous and we've seen the impact of that in the lives lost um uh, due to the coronavirus. I think a lot of people have uh, sort of taken on this narrative that, you know, it, it, we don't know what this virus is. We don't know why certain organizations are trying to tell us it's something or it's not something. And so we're going to continue our lives. Um, we're going to not wear our masks um, because I, it, again, there's a sort of odd narrative, which I've seen only in the United States and nowhere else, although maybe it is elsewhere, that somehow wearing a mask is not masculine. Um, and that, you know, we ought to have the freedom to choose to not wear masks. Um, and, uh, and, and a lot of these narratives are really, really gaining traction, even though they have no real merit that I can see. Um, and so kind of my deepest concern right now is the source of, of information, um, you know, 2020 and beyond. Where do, does the average person look to for news that they trust, um, for information that they trust? Um, Part of kind of what I've learned <laughs> uh, as a sort of crash course to biochemistry in the last few months is that um, a lot of people, you know, and I'm sure Swati will speak more to this as well, this is a brand new virus. And so people have been sort of churning out information as it comes. Uh, and that's often contradictory information. And rather than simply understanding this is the sort of way science works, people have assumed that there's some, some kind of conspiracy being perpetrated against them. Um, so as someone who studies the kind of the laws of the United States and particularly the First Amendment and what can and cannot and should and should not be said in the public forum, um, this is my kind of main concern and main interest area right now. Uh, President Grief, Hakeem, I think you're muted. Sweet. Uh, just quickly before we move on to the next speaker, just a quick response from you. We have seen since 2016 that increasingly elections are being kind of held hostage new technology, you know, other governments actually interfering. And this seems to be a perpetuating trend. What is your take on this very quickly onto the future of elections in the light of the technology, which is fast evolving, highly accessible, and where fake news travel much faster than, you know, research news, as you have rightly said. So as a, you know, as a young person, how, how do you see that evolving? Just quickly, just give us your take on this. So, so a couple of different things. I think uh, ultimately the idea of one country interfering in another country's elections is not new. It's something that major powers have been doing in the in the context of smaller countries for for decades, if not for centuries, really. Um, but I think the idea that uh, it's being done covertly and it's being done in a way that people don't realize that their minds are being shaped or that conspiracy theories are being specifically targeted toward them on social media to act on their own particular biases or their own particular fears, that is new. Um, and I, you know, it, it's one thing 
to be forced to vote for someone at gunpoint, you know what's happening. It's another thing to have your unconscious biases manipulated in such a way that suddenly, you know, you believe that a certain candidate was not born in the United States, et cetera. Um, so I, I think the level of sophistication to which this is happening um, is new. And, I, you know, I think ultimately we're sort of conditioned to, like, ultimately we want to avoid sort of paranoid slippery slope of we don't know if anything's real, we don't know if anything's true, we don't know what to trust. Um, so I think what happens is essentially people double down on their confirmation bias and just assume that everything they already know must be doubly true. Uh, and everything that contradicts what they think they know um, is in fact a conspiracy theory meant to kind of separate them from their values, meant to help, you know, have them forget their history, et cetera. Um, so I think we'll, we'll see more factions and less civil discourse. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, David. We'll go to the next speaker, Newton Davis, who will give us uh, his view on uh, you know, what we're discussing and what are your take as well on uh, the future as we emerge post-COVID. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for having me and for organizing this. Really excited to participate. Um, as you mentioned, my name is Newton Davis and I am originally from the United States. Born and raised in Michigan, um, but currently living in Berlin, Germany, um, where I'm working at Beyond 1435, which is a consortium of rail operators and providers who are thinking about the future of mobility outside of their main um, business activities, which is either creating the infrastructure for, for rail um, or, or actually operating um, that infrastructure. Um, I think that you brought up some really interesting topics and I have been thinking about ways to sort of tie them together. Um, I think I'll, I'll, I'll start with the Black Lives Matter because I think that uh, it's, it's a good way to sort of uh, think about all of these things that we talked about, coronavirus, increased nationalism and social media uh, together. And I try to sort of bring in um, some of the elements of, of the work that I do, which is focused specifically on, on movement um, of people, goods, data, um, throughout throughout space and, and, and across different geographies. Um, and so I think what we've been seeing recently uh, with the, the increased attention played to the Black Lives Matter movement um, is, is just sort of a, a reiteration of, of, of things that have been in existence for a long time in the United States um, and around the world. Um, I recently had a conversation in, in which someone sort of asked me why they felt uh, this Black Lives Matter movement had so much steam and, and, and became so international uh, and recently. And, and my response to them is that uh, the struggle for um, anti-racism um, and, and inequality and justice and, and, and anti-colonial struggles have, have been going on for a very long time. And those struggles, um, no matter what geography, have always been interlinked in, in the sort of international discourse around justice and equality. Um, and I think what Black Lives Matter movement now we're seeing um, in the United States um, and around the world is, is sort of an increased engagement um, in that. And, and I think uh, the rallying cry of, of looking at videos of, of, of people being killed, you know, on Twitter and on Instagram and on Facebook um, in the midst of a pandemic when many people um, are, are home and, and have, you know, not much else to do but to look at their screens um, created a, this, this sort of perfect storm that, that, that galvanized people to, to want to go out into the street and to protest. Um, and, and I don't think that there's anything that I can say today um, that hasn't been said before by many other people who are much more intelligent and much more studied than I am about this issue. Uh, but I do think that it, it's important that we recognize that, uh, that this is something that has been ongoing in the United States and around the world. Um, and, and, it, and it is a fight that I think uh, it, it is, is really important that, that we have um, and, and a conversation that we have uh, specifically as we talk about the coronavirus um, and, and the impact that, that it's having um, uh, on our on our worlds and, and on our people, I, I'm not sure how people how familiar people are with the statistics um, in the United States, but um, the majority of of, of 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 COVID deaths have been people of color, um, both black and brown in the United States, and I think that the Black Lives Matter movement tries to emphasize uh, the systemic situation that causes a situation in which people who represent um, a rather minuscule part of the population or a minority in the population um, are overrepresented in, in the deaths um, in, in, a, in a situation in a crisis like this. Um, and thinking about how th that sort of ties to the work that, that 
I'm doing today, uh, it, it's really about thinking um, about, about the future of, of how we get around. And so the coronavirus, for many of the people who work in, in mobility, um, maybe to take a step back to define mobility for those people who aren't in, <laughs> as engaged in the space as I am, mobility is defined uh, as the movement of, of people and goods um, across air, land, sea, and some people include space in that. And so you can think of it more broadly as the transportation and logistics departments um, or, or transportation and logistics more broadly. Um, people tend to stay away from the use of transportation and logistics because they refer to legacy systems, whereas mobility is thinking about what the future of these systems can look like. Um, and so where transportation will think about the means, you know, you have a train track, um, mobility will think about, you know, what, what are the ways that we can achieve this goal. Um, and so that is where you can start to think about micro mobility options, which we see um, around the world in the terms of bike share or scooter share, or you can think about aerial drones or, you know, unmanned drones that, that can carry passengers um, in, in, around short distances. And so with respect to, to that space, I think what um, coronavirus has, has done is really accelerated a lot of trends that were already in place. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about sort of uh, the lack of, uh, or the decline in, in, in federal direct investment, or foreign direct investment, excuse me, um, across different, different countries. And, and I think uh, that what coronavirus has, has done has also impacted mobility in, in, in that same way. Um, many of the plans um, and the companies that we, we held up as champions just a year ago, um, you can look to some of the scooter sharing companies like Lime and Bird, um, you know, held up in 2019 as sort of the, the poster child for, for what the future of, of mobility and transportation can look like, um, you know, just this 12 months later are, are asking for bailouts or are being, you know, being invested in at, at rates that are much lower than the, the, the rates that they, they raised in their last rounds. Um, and I think that that's a testament to uh, the way in which the system of mobility has been, um, been constructed over the last 10 years with a, a real focus on sort of ride sharing um, and a focus on you know, delivering of goods. And so I think it's important to sort of parse those two, two different elements out. Ride sharing in a lot of ways uh, was subsidized by venture capital dollars uh, seeking alternative returns um, in, in markets be, because, you know, as, as we all are well aware of, interest rates have been historically low over the last, you know, 12 years. Um, and, and investors who have large stocked public cash have to park that somewhere in hopes of growth. Um, and in private investments were, were the way in which that was done. Uh, and so mobility obviously benefited from that. Um, and so your Uber ride was cheaper, your DD ride was cheaper because some venture capital somewhere decided that that was a valuable uh, startup and something that needed to happen. Um, with the expectation that, that at some point we would figure out a way to, to make those things profitable. Uh, what we found is that that's not the case, right? We can look at Uber stock today. We can look at many of the scooter companies that I named. We don't even need to dive into the devastation that happened uh, with a lot of the bike share programs out of China uh, to, to see that that model in its current state does not necessarily function. And what coronavirus has sort of pulled um, whatever thinly veiled uh, facade that was there before completely off and people are now much more interested in thinking about how do we create a system or a structure that will allow people to commute safely, um, either to work or to get their goods safely. Um, so going back to my point in which I talked about sort of the focus over the last 10 years being in, in two places, you know, we also have the first being the ride hailing or the, the sharing, uh, the second being, like I said, sort of delivery. Um, and we've seen sort of on that other hand, you know, while one has really suffered in the mobility space, the logistics piece of it has, has really picked up. Um, and that obviously brings a lot of opportunity, but also exposes a lot of cracks in our infrastructure. Um, and I think that moving forward, what, what I expect to see is a, a lot more focus on building the underlying technologies and, uh, and, and businesses that are required to be able to connect all of these disparate pieces together. Um, so to give you a, a more concrete example, uh, you know, Amazon is one of the largest in the United States. It's one of the largest users of, of, of the United States Postal Service. Just quickly round up, uh, uh, just, just quickly round up a bit because we are... We are oh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit over. Okay. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, so I think in, 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 terms of, in terms of where the, the world uh, is heading um, in, in the mobility space, uh, it, it's really a focus on uh, providing that, those next level opportunities um, that... that may not have, they may haven't, may, excuse me, may, 
that may not exist yet, but uh, are, are really necessary um, sort of these baseline layers of our base layers to, to create new technology so that in 10 years we can have a situation where autonomy autonomy is is, is quite easy um, access to micro mobility options are, are, are easy and public transportation options are also seamlessly integrated into a network that allows everyone um, regardless of where they live or the color of their skin to have equal access to transportation and, and the logistics Thank you. Thank you so much for your, for your input. Uh, just one thing, just to link up to what uh, David has just mentioned and also to what you talked about in terms of the Black Lives Matter. Um, I think uh, what uh, uh, David mentioned is that there has been this rally who has started in Tulsa, uh, right uh, in Oklahoma. And uh, we have seen also a lot of talk on Tulsa. But I think the talk on Tulsa has really come up uh, this year in the context of the Black Lives Matter movement. Do you agree, and this of course we can discuss it in the court of our conversation, do you agree that events like Black Lives Matter has put a lot of focus on something which is perhaps not spoken about, the history of Black Americans, Black African Americans in the United States, also elsewhere in the world? Do you feel, and this is something we can come back with, and uh, we can come back to later on, do you feel there is sufficient information which has been documented, which form the basis, of course, to raise the consciousness of the history of Black Americans in America or elsewhere in the world. And this is, again, we can, we can discuss this because increasing, as I said, a Tulsa is being raised. Of course, we know the, the, the dark history of Tulsa. Um, this is, of course, something that we can come back to later in the conversation if you have time. But the essence is that enough is not perhaps being spoken about the history of Black Americans in the United States. So anyway, we'll come back to this later on, which makes, of course, very interesting discussion. So the next speaker is Jared Fisher. So can we have Jared, please? Jared is with us. We have Ivan Ivanov. Uh, Ivanov, okay. So let's have Ivan, Ivan Ivanov, and uh, we'll have Jared hopefully if he joins us later. Ivan. Well, hi. Hello, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. And uh, can you hear me, right? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, first of all, thank you so much. And enormous thanks to Nizami Ganjal International Center, especially to Roshan, who always had. A lot of the contribution doesn't matter if it's time of pandemic or peaceful time. So it's um, great to be here and to see all of you guys after all this time, even on Zoom meeting and hopefully in brief short future, we're going to see each other on some event somewhere in the world. So uh, greetings from Macedonia. And as you know, I'm uh, right now I'm professor, assistant professor at the International Balkan University in Political Science and also working with the Alliance of Civilization as a board member. And we had some lovely plans for uh, the upcoming uh, decade, but however, things, uh, many things happened, uh, including the, the COVID situation, so we postponed everything. But I would like a little bit to, to share my opinions from more theoretical and let's say philosophical background of what's going on right today, because during this time of pandemic, we had, let's say, a lovely opportunity to rethink some concepts and to reread some books, all forgotten books, and to try to be speculative and to provide some, maybe our new uh, paradigms for the future and to see from where can we go from now. So it is interesting that during this time, we pay attention to some interesting elements, important elements of our being. And I was thinking a lot about time as a category. I was thinking about freedom as a concept, I was thinking about fear as a tool. I was thinking about democracy and also about a social contract or a need of a new social contract maybe in the time that will follow. And of course, and the hope as a, as a state of mind. So I was explaining with my colleagues and I were arguing how to explain really simple this period that is happening right now during the pandemic and during the COVID uh, situation and then used one term that was mentioned from Anthony Gramsci, the famous Italian Marxist, who talked about the period between two great wars. And while he was in prison, he mentioned this really famous quote of him uh, explaining when the old world is dying and the new world struggles to be born and it's time of morbidity or morbid symptoms or Zizek later will use it, the phrase uh, monsters, which I think is pretty right. So I believe that right now we're living in this kind, this kind of interregnum or time between two times, because depending on the needs, the term itself 
of interregnum and its application offered by uh, current and temporary or irregular uh, events caused by a variety of symptoms, trends, I might say historical uh, deals, historical events, personalities, represents a time interval that it indicates that a, there is an interruption in the certain uh, continuity. So this time interval between two periods is most often used to define a temporal space from the end of one reign to another uh, sovereign ruler. So this is the origin from the Roman law. But however, now we're talking about interregnum that reflects the time interval that is uh, a kind of vacuum period. And it's period of temporariness or something that is known in the theory as uh, interim. So that is period that is filled with failures of the old order or the old world order and the sparkle of hope that is brought by the new still unborn order, let's say, in the uh, terms of Gramsci. So this ad interim period of interregnum, it's, I might say, a little bit dangerous, but dangerous in the sense that it's, uh, it's, it consists a threat to itself if it fails to get rid of the constraints that led up to the state of fear and the state of uncertainty and alternatives that will only change their forms, but not the content. So I was thinking whether we're having this period a long time ago or, or it occurred during the pandemic time. Is it started with the, maybe the, the disturbance in the world order, in the dominance of the Western ideas or with the last economic crisis or it started now during the pandemic time. So I'll just briefly refer to one of the really uh, important uh, authors and one of the most famous sociologists of the 21st century, Zygmunt Bauman, who said that it's not possible to endure this kind of, of, uh, of interregnum because it is the time in which the old ways of doing things are no longer functional, are ineffective, while the new instruments that should be uh, practiced are not still invented. So Bauman disagrees with the fact that the period of change in which we live is, can be characterized with a transition. Because in order for you to have a transition uh, and to transition to take place, you have to know the place where you're going from here to go there. So that is needed, but we're not really sure where are we going. We know that we are here and we want to go somewhere there, but we're not really capable now to focus and to, to, to see the place that we really want to go. So, According to him, there are several things that are really problematic that can lead to this kind of period, and that is the ignorance, that is the, the impotence of people, and there is also the crisis of the age, that the things should be done, but who should do these things? Because the real ideas are really prolific. So one of the topics that they mentioned is, uh, will science save us? And from the aspect of political science and from the aspect of rereading the old and forgotten words, I think that we did not really learn some things from the history and from the past because how all this situation and the pandemic really uh, affected the globalization and the world politics. So there are some events and crises that can be foreseen and there are some crises and events that cannot. So COVID was part of the former, I think. So from everything that we hear so far, especially from politicians, from physicians, it is accurate that this is a new type of virus that uh, exact date when the outbreak would occur could not be really precisely uh, uh, foreseen. So, however, we cannot deny that the competent person in this area have long warned that the outbreaks of such pandemic might happen, might happen almost every moment. So, although we cannot draw historical parallels with the epidemics of the past or something that Tocqueville said, we cannot take the old pictures and force them into new frames because they will always look out of place. But somehow the question is that, that comes naturally is what did the competent, uh, competent institutions and international organizations undertake when they were already aware of this type of pandemic and this kind of pandemic will happen because weren't SARS, Ebola uh, and other epidemics a sufficient warning of what might happen to us right now. And the pandemics are basically, maybe I'm wrong, but they basically predictable because they regularly occur in the human history and viruses are part of nature or at least until recently so same as the pandemics are or were natural events so one cannot oppose them individually rather only as a society and how we are capable uh, to efficiently mobilize the the resources so there's really great piece from 2004 and if you allow me i'll just 
really quickly, because I want quickly to... Ivan, please, can you? Yeah, yeah. Yes. So from the uh, American National Intelligence Council for mapping the global future in 2012, and it was issued in 2004, and it stated that the process of globalization, powerful as it is, could be sustainably slowed or even stopped, short of major global conflict, which we regard improbable. Another large-scale development that we believe could be could stop globalization would be pandemic. Such pandemic in mega cities in the developing world with poor health care in sub-Saharan Africa, China, India, Bangladesh, or Pakistan would be devastating and could spread rapidly through the world, and globalization would be endangered. So it's really interesting how the, this whole pandemic really is um, putting an emphasis on the globalization. Because let's take just for example, just in one minute if I have time. There was a text recently in April, I think, uh, or in March, that was published uh, in Wall Street Journal. I don't know the, the topic really, but uh, it was from Henry Kissinger, who, who confirmed the predictions that was stated in the 2004 document. In his opinion, the coronavirus caused the collapse of the global economy and, of course, the globalization. And Kissinger asked for protection of the principles of the global liberal order, pointing out that the USA should insist on security order economic well-being and justice. So the world uh, democracies need to defend and sustain the Enlightenment values. But going back to the Enlightenment values, I'm a uh, little bit skeptical. Either we're in this trap of linear progress, because for sure we're going in right direction with all the technological development, with all um, blockchain technology, with uh, artificial intelligence. But I think now is the time where we can brought up again the theories of cyclicity because every system in nature and even the ones who were created by man as a civilization, as states have their own path, they're being born, uh, they're culminated and declined and they're dead. So right now I do believe that we're in that trap of the enlightenment that maybe this is the end of an era and maybe it's a chance for a new paradigm because everything that we hear during this time is post notions, like post democracy, post capitalism, post news, uh, post truth, fake news and everything. But maybe I think it's time for us to, to come up with something that is new, but not new normality that we're hearing now, because I'm not sure that everything that was happening in the world before the pandemic was really normal. So that's why I'm not really uh, sure that we should only add suffixes to old theories, just to post pawn them let's to say the post notion so that's why i think that this momentum it's a quite important for our mental uh, uh acceleration and mental let's say revolution in order to think how to use our creative minorities that toyn be said because in order to have those creative minorities you should have exile before and our exile was the Can you up, please Ivan? yeah yeah, was the, the, the quarantine. So that's why I'm thinking that probably this is the right time when maybe it's a end of that interregnum and then it's a momentum when we can come up with a new paradigm and not only use uh, notions that were for the uh, previous world. Thank you. So we will take that into our discussion later on whether we are moving, whether China or the virus or any other forces they are going to redefine the new world order. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we now have Rachel, medical doctor. Rachel Lung, please. I thank you so much for bringing up the issue of technology and also how it would transform the medical system. So uh, I personally work uh, with medical doctors in Hong Kong to be on the front line. Uh, in Hong Kong situation, we actually have it under control largely because of the public's ability to really contain the virus by social distancing and personal uh, means, not necessarily because of other uh, factors, for example, us doctors in the system, or because of uh, excessive supply from China, or because of very effective government response. It's really, if you ask my opinion, it's come, it comes down to personal experience with the SARS epidemic that we had uh, in 20, uh, 2003. So this really has a lot of lasting impacts on Hong Kong people in terms of how we respond to news. Uh, I think the situation we have in here might be slightly different from the situation elsewhere when fake news is prevalent. We do have such situ uh, situation, uh, especially in the area of personal protective equipments, for example, the use of different types of masks, as some of my panelists has already brought up. 
as well as other means to provide an alternative cure for the virus, not, at, not to an extreme of um, uh, ingesting in, uh, disinfectants, but definitely some other alternative means, uh, and as well as other areas of uh, daily living, for example, panic buying, etc., which was prevalent in many of the Asia countries where we were hit by the virus earlier on. So, and in terms of what I'm looking at, uh, I'm really interested in looking at how technology is able to revolutionize the uh, healthcare system in terms of how COVID-19 uh, has brought up this change and has seen this change. So in a clinical area, what we are seeing is that in the rapid response in China, uh, it's able to use a lot of technology to help with diagnosis and management of its patients. So uh, a couple of my panelists has already brought up that in developing country, there's a lack of the coping mechanism in terms of lack of resources devoted to R&D, which I think this is an issue that we need to focus on in the future because China has actually able, been able to leverage um, some of its R&D previous initiatives, be it foreign investments or its local initiatives to really leverage the data collection as well as the power of AI to bring forth better um, identification of patients in terms of diagnosis of suspected cases by, for example, auto dialing to survey patients for symptoms, as well as monitoring patients' conditions. In terms of radiological development, the process of AI has really been revolutionizing. For example, uh, uh, there's a lot of controversies definitely in the area of whether radiological evidence is sufficient by itself to diagnose patients, but the use of radiolo radiological evidence in managing patients is unarguably very important. So in many of the Chinese settings, there's actually remote uh, diagnosis of patients using radiological uh, detection techniques. So if a patient is able to use AI to to, to do patient body mapping and take a high quality image in its own uh, isolation suite, then the doctor do not need to go inside the suite to perform the high risk procedures that would save a PPE, that would reduce the risk of transmission, et cetera, et cetera. And even that imaging, that uh, radiological data would be able to transmit and upload to the cloud for remote diagnosis from say for example, specialists in respiratory medicine in another province. So these are really revolutionizing factors that we have seen in China, especially for example, in companies like United Imaging, uh, Infervision, these are definitely exciting uh, changes that we see, but such a technology is lacking in developing areas. For example, in, in many areas like India, Indonesia, there's really a lack of imaging capacity and the lack of swift uh, tweaking uh, agility because of the lack of fundamental infrastructure. Um, so this is a point that I want to highlight. Another thing is that there's a lot of, um, when, we're, when we're talking about the rise of nationalism and also whether there's a, an infringement in the personal's rights, um, there's definitely an area that many countries are looking into collecting pet personal level data. Uh, this, it, this was seen in, in countries like India, in Singapore, in Taiwan, and also in China. So in India, there's, um, for, for contact tracing, the government has actually ruled out an application that really encourages people, uh, their countrymen to download, if not coerce. But the, in the end of the day, the adoption rate was actually very, still very low, below 20%, which was far beyond the optimal rate for contact tracing to be effective because there was, con uh, there was worried about whether there's personal uh, level data collection, whether there's uh, GIS, GPS level data collection, and what are they going to use with the data? So these are really security level uh, issues that, na that needs to be dealt with at a national level when they're enabled to collect personal uh, level data, which I think in Singapore, the case was more um, well perceived as compared to other countries when uh, people actually work from home for months and they're able to cope with the government's order to do contact tracing and really stay a distance from other people and report suspected cases. So we can see different countries responding to similar technology with very, very different um, mentality and response from its people. So um, these are the several points I would like to highlight and uh, I, I'm happy to speak more in terms of the clinical management, how AI is able to assist our diagnosis, our management, and, uh, and also speak about the future of AI. But I'm also happy to hear from other panelists if you have anything to add on. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel. Very interesting. Precisely, I mean, the, the take of various countries on the same technology and how it's applied as well. Thanks for highlighting this. Uh, very interesting indeed. Uh, we have the next speaker, John Ridos from the Blair Academy. John? Uh, thank you, Pre President Karupa Kim. Thank you, Rokshan, and the Nizambi Kanjavi International Center. Thank you to all of you. Um, it's been a pleasure uh, listening to you thus far. So from my end, I kind of want to share and touch upon many of the topics that have already been touched upon, but also kind of share the questions that have been keeping me up at night. Um, so Blair is a preparatory school in New Jersey, and before Blair, I've taught in uh, Oxford, England, and actually in Montenegro as a Fulbright um, ETA there, where I kind of did a lot of teacher training work in addition to working with students themselves. Um, so I guess before I go, I want to kind of open with a question, and during while I'm talking, like what would you want kind of today's students to hear? Because um, I'm happy to be your vehicle, uh, you know, for your students, you know, from the last Global Baku Forum, I took so much and that's kind of like ingrained in my teaching. So that's what I'm hoping to, you know, in addition to providing my insights, taking from you all today. So I first want to break it down, kind of like what I'm seeing here at Blair and institutions like Blair, kind of what my concerns are in the public institution and then thinking kind of post COVID where I am hoping we kind of focus on in the educational world. And I guess as an educator, um, just like my students, I'm still learning. Um, and so I'm very open to learning. And that is kind of like what my whole summer has in store. Um, so first, I want to touch upon uh, kind of the Black, the Black Lives Matter movement um, and how it specifically during the COVID period is taking institutions like Blair uh, by storm and our students are forming a revolution, so to speak, and rightfully so. Um, kind of due to the systematic racism that our country has been facing. Um, and I guess it's my role as an educator and I think as teachers to um, help, what can I be doing to help support my students? How can I help them find a voice? And what can we be doing moving forward um, as an administrator to make systematic changes to a system that otherwise has smothered equality um, so to speak, over centuries. Um, and so, for example, talking about the media, there's a lot going on in terms of, let's say we've talked about like the call out culture. So many private institutions uh, in the country and public education institutions have created Instagram posts where it is, let's say black at that institution. And it's stories of when students, faculty, um, have faced systematic racism from members of that institution. And so how do we react? How do we move forward? How do we, you know, teach students, but I think most importantly on my end, how do we think about teaching teachers and administrators about how to have those conversations with our students? Because um, ultimately I think education provides one of the best but most complicated platforms in making a change. And as we've proven um, in the COVID-19 pandemic, if we all focus on something and the world decides to focus on something, we can make, we've proven that we can make very big impactful changes um, in a short period of time. And so moving into public institutions, the questions that keep me up at night um, and moving on to what you mentioned about access to education, which I don't think, which is still very much related to Black Lives Matter to the COVID pandemic is the problems that have come from this coronavirus pandemic and the, the populations that are being affected mostly um, by, let's say, switching to a virtual education. Here at Blair and at other private institutions, access to technology, as we've talked about, has certainly made learning and education possible, but that's not something that's necessarily common to most students. I'd say majority of students in the world don't have the access to technology to community onwards and the teachers weren't prepared to be able to teach online and need the resources to come in. But now what's happening is that lower income socioeconomic status students, which have more often than not tend to be students of color are now falling and the gap is, let's say, is widening. And how are we going to move moving forward? Because as of now, it doesn't look like there's going to be 
a vaccine by the time schools start up around the world uh, during the respective time. So what are we going to do um, in terms of that? And will our access, especially in the United States, um, with we have, a, you know, we're in the midst of a pandemic. We're in the midst of a, a you know, black, the Black Lives Matter movement. And we're in the midst of a presidential election. Um, all things happening at once. And my hope is that when we start up in September, the most, you know, these important things don't get pushed to the wayside and we can teach our students and faculty to help, you know, as a collective, you know, make sure we're keeping an eye on things and decipher the media because there's a lot of stuff going out. And like, I, as you mentioned, they watch as the latest science comes out and the latest research comes out and it's contradicting. And I'm like, well, this makes sense to me because I've been educated this way, but how do I educate my students to look at the media and not take it as truth? Um, and I think that we'll get to, I guess, my post-COVID um, point, but it's keeping an open mind. And ultimately you need people that want to do that. So my, my job as an educator is how do I make people want to teach that? And how do I make people want to learn that? And I think that's one of the biggest challenges I am facing and we are facing as let's say an educational community because um, moving into the you know public institution, like in addition, you know, students are going hungry. You know, I mean, public education in the United States is also providing two free meals a day to many people. Um, what is happening to the parents that stay at home um, and otherwise would go to work? Um, so education is more than just like a learning. It's like a community center. And so how are we going to, let's say, in the post-COVID world, I think we do get a chance to reshape and reform um, our education system. And I hope we do take that to bridge the gap because I think it comes down to the question, will science save us? Um, and I think science can save us, but science can't save us alone. I think motivation, but how do you... Can you try to wrap up, John? We are short. Yeah. We get how do we pinpoint motivation um, when there are so many other big pressing issues? And I guess those are the things that keep me up at night. So do you have anything you would like to go out to the student population of at least New Jersey? I'd love to hear. <laughs> Thank you so much. In fact, these are questions I think which are keeping most educators awake uh, at night everywhere. Access to technology and readapting, of course, to the new normal as we open up after COVID. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll go on to now Emil Scandal. Hello, Prince Herbert. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you can sure. introduce me or I can introduce myself, whichever works. Um, thank you, Rafshan. Thank you, NGIC, uh, President Group, Rakim. Um, I uh, love you know, talking about technology policy. Um, unfortunately, right now we're in the midst of uh, multiple crises, right? We're in the midst of a health crisis, an economic crisis, um, and a crisis of inequality and racial justice. Um, just a quick background on me. Um, I run a technology firm called Capital Founder. I started it eight years ago. We design and build applications. My first clients were actually Stanford University researchers and doctors. We built uh, health tech applications uh, using genomic data. Um, and then we went on and we uh, designed apps for Nike and folks like that. Um, for the past 10 years though, I've been writing op-ed commentary. Um, I write about technology policy, specifically focused on technology ecosystems and clusters. Um, and now I've obviously written about um, quite a few other topics, uh, mobile voting, government technology, um, and I'll have a few pieces coming out on uh, on uh, yeah, apps and contact tracing and that sort of thing. Um, that's a quick background on me. Um, uh, and diving into, I guess, some of the tech topics. Um, I, uh, you know, during this entire crisis, actually, I was working on a project. Um, I built out COVID19.nyc. It's a public health information website for New York City. Um, the problem that we realized that um, uh, that New, York, New Yorkers were having during this crisis, and you know, again, Queens and New York City was the hardest hit in the world at one point. Um, there was an, it was an information crisis, right? People didn't know the symptoms. They didn't know, um, you know, what the transmissibility of um, of uh, the COVID was, coronavirus was, um, and you know, essentially, all pandemics are information crises, right? People don't know, um, you know, what's the what's the R not, um, you know, who's most at risk, um, and that sort of thing. And I think what technology does is it allows us to better adapt to the information we have or don't have, right? Um, and this is the first uh, pandemic of the information age, right? The last major pandemic was in 1958, 
Um, oh, sorry, 1968. There was also one in 1958. Um, but you know, the information age began in the 1970s, and we haven't had a crisis um, of this scale since then, right? We've had small crises, SARS, uh, you know, Ebola, things like that. Um, but this is the first global crisis, um, and it really it's it's testing it's testing our technology. Um, and you know, in a few short months, we've had to rebuild society um, to be nearly an entirely digital one. Um, how we how do we communicate now? How do we work? How do we live? Um, how do we socialize? Everything's changed um, for the most part. It will go back to normal eventually, but for now, things have changed, and some of those things will continue to be that way. Um, so, um, you know, as we talk about technology, I think the the you know technology isn't a panacea for everything, um, and uh, you know, the major tension between technology and the individual is really privacy rights, right? So all the solutions that have been put forth right now have to do with pri privacy, right? Either it's individual privacy from, you know, a third party, um, such as a government entity or whatever, or it's just privacy in general from hackers and um, black hat hackers and folks like that. Um, so um, throughout this entire, I guess, the past three or four months, <laughs> Um, I, I've had a few, uh, you know, op-ed pieces, and, and I would say the, the most important topics, um, technology, uh, I guess, driven topics, um, include like contact tracing apps, uh, wearables, uh, public health information, right, and misinformation, disinformation, um, the concept of digital immunity passports, um, which is something we'll talk about in a second, um, blockchain um, for verifiability and stuff like that. Um, that was something that um, started to come up as fake goods were being produced, um, goods that weren't um, you know, sufficient for doctors. Um, and we've seen, you know, AI uh, kind of weave itself into, um, you know, uh, uh, um, responsive treatment, right? Identifying at-risk uh, at lifestyles or areas. Um, and then the other two things that, that um, two other tech-related topics that are really important, one is like the tech the tech economy, right? The innovation economy. Now everyone's, you know, defaulting to remote work. Um, we're all obviously video conferencing from all over the world, but we've been doing this for months now. <laughs> um, and how does that change things for the future? Um, and then the last and probably the most important thing is how do we vote right in this age? Um, I'm a very big advocate of mobile voting and internet voting. Um, there are a lot of brilliant people out there that are against this idea. I think it, it should be implemented uh, limitedly, you know, um, through pilots and in other sort of ways. But I really think at the end of the day, you know, that's going to be changing. Um, but just to go back to contact tracing apps, um, I'll kind of sum, you know, summarize all of those seven or eight different areas. Um, you know, contact tracing apps haven't been effective, right? Um, they, they really haven't. India has had pretty wide adoption um, in in the tens of millions, maybe even hundreds of millions. Uh, right now, they're the third, uh, I think, fastest spreading country. Unfortunately, months ago, they weren't. Um, the U.S. has only had, you know, a few million uh, uh, downloads, even though Google has, you know, Google and, and uh, Apple have released their API. Um, you know, there are a number of reasons why this isn't, um, why it hasn't been effective. A lot of people are concerned about their privacy rights, right? There's also the infrastructure for it, you know, should should um, you know contact tracing app be decentralized or centralized? Right, is it more effective if the government's putting it out there as opposed to having a Bluetooth API that other uh, developers can integrate into their apps? Um, so it, it's you know we thought that contact tracing would would be really effective via mobile app and it hasn't, um, and that's that's an unfortunate um, situation, right? Even though it's really simple technology. Contact tracing Bluetooth is really old technology. It's actually, it's, it's pretty bad, all right? And it doesn't work that well. Um, but uh, there is other technology out there that's going to help prevent people from getting infected. My belief is that, you know, wearables could have solved a lot of the problems that we had. Imagine if we bought everyone a Fitbit. Literally, it would cost US $20 billion to buy everyone a Fitbit. The NBA is buying basketball players rings, right? At a cost of $300 or $400 a ring to see see if their heart rate's going up, if their temperature's changing, right? People aren't looking to those solutions. And again, it could be a privacy thing, wearing a, a wearable or something like that. But I'm actually surprised that cities didn't consider that. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about health monitoring at job sites where Amazon's putting up sensors and people walk into a building, let's say, if, uh, you know, at their uh, white collar job and they're getting their temperature checked, you know, is that an infringement of poly, uh, privacy too? You know, and, and at the same time, do I have a right to my health? You know, if I'm in that same building with you. 
Um, there's a little bit of a balance, of course, with that. Um, yeah. So um, anyway, uh, the future of all of this, you know, I think, you know, digital immunity passports probably not going to be a thing um, because the antibody testing is so unreliable, but it would be really, really great if we had um, a way for people to cross borders and say, hey, I'm okay with things, you know, I had a vaccine or whatever. Um, I think, you know, throughout this entire crisis, we, we have had issues. Um, one of the big ones and the simplest thing to solve for is public health information. The website we built tried to um, uh, bring all that information together from public health authorities and put it in one place and make it visually um, uh, understandable for people. Unfortunately, epidemiologists really mess things up. The World Health Organization really messed things up and it, that can't be understated. The, the, the UN, the WHO, they really did not do a good job. Um, and even the epidemiologists in the US. So um, that gave rise to conspiracy theories and that gave rise to folks making up their, their, their own you know, social media posts to share and even videos like pandemic. Um, so um, anyway, technology is a solution. Um, it's certainly not a panacea for a lot of um, you know, what we're experiencing right now. Again, technology over the past few decades is just increasing. Um, you know, in, in our lives, the huge use and, and so forth and so on. Um, and uh, most importantly, again, if I could say, I'm just going to leave off with the fact that, you know, we should be investing in the innovation economy. We should be looking to offset the jobs that are going to be lost from automation, um, reskilling people, right? Automation isn't going to destroy jobs. It's going to recreate jobs. Um, and so we should, we should be focusing on that. And then lastly, um, you know, I hear in New York, we're gonna have a huge problem with voting. Um, already we're having that issue. And um, I really think that we should have emergency balloting um, via mobile voting. Um, you know, not every single country needs to be Estonia, but I think it's really important that there are other options out there for people to cast their ballot and to change things, right? So we can go out and protest and everything else, but at the same time, we have to go out and vote. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, right, we go on to the last speaker, Swati, please. Hi, thank you very much. And thank you to everyone for your comments today. I'll try to keep this quick so we have some time for discussion. Um, so I think, uh, spend my days thinking about the academic uh, scientific research enterprise. Um, and, you know, both the, the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, the Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter movement um, have exposed and laid bare a, a uh, a lot of aspects of this enterprise that um, many of us were thinking about already and really kind of brought them to the forefront. But before I jump into that, I actually wanted to reflect on something you said in your introduction, President uh, Group that came was, uh, you were talking about this, this new sort of brand of leadership that was having a high degree of success. It was compassionate, credible, feminine, and scientific. And that stuck with me so much uh, because there was a time when we would think of a lot of those things as antonyms, right? We would think of the compassionate and the feminine as uh, somewhat polar opposites to the credible and the scientific. And it is really, that has been one of the really heartening things in this time of crisis is to watch how well and how naturally those things hang together on the global stage. Uh, so I really, I wanted to, to connect with that really quickly. Um, you know, a, a lot of folks here have, have spoken about the role of technology um, in the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, basic science, I think, has, uh, you know, an equally strong role. Again, it's, you know, not a panacea, as Emil said, but uh, something that is critical to be part of the solution. Um, you know, my own organization, the National Science Foundation, has been, and, you know, I don't speak for them as an organization, but they have been um, investing in, you know, mathematicians who are working on epidemiological mod uh, modeling. Uh, they've been investing in, in material scientists who are looking at, you know, uh, different materials for face masks. Uh, they're looking at the physical and biological properties of the virus. And I think, you know, one of the really interesting things is that we often tend to think of sort of a linear progression from science to technology to impact. And right now we're seeing it all collapsed into this moment where we're, we're doing the basic science around this virus, we're developing the technologies that will help us solve this virus all in real time, all simultaneously. Um, and I think that's a, a really interesting um, departure from the way that we normally think about the progress of science and technology. Um, 
And, you know, Dave spoke uh, very articulately <laughs> about um, the, the role of the media and, and kind of the skepticism that comes around having science revealed to you in real time. Um, and, you know, I, I work as a science communicator a lot of the time, and it's, it's made me think a lot about the way that we view um, science as a, as a almost static entity, right? A, a static body of, you know, objectively correct knowledge. Um, and we tend to obscure the, the processes and the enterprise that make science possible. Um, and I think we're seeing a lot of that revealed in real time. Um, and that has, has sort of come to the fore with the way that we think about recovering from COVID among the scientific research enterprise. It is not just that we need to fund COVID research, it's that we need to think about the research enterprise as infrastructure, as people, as you know, all of these aspects that are affected by you know, the, the entire global supply chain. Newton spoke really articulately about mobility. Mobility, international mobility, is a huge science and technology issue. So much of the scientific workforce in the United States is dependent on countries like China and India uh, kind of exporting their, their people, their students, to the United States to do scientific work here. Um, and, you know, I think we've seen a lot of scares around uh, China and around being afraid of China and having to um, mitigate the, the security risk, which are certainly real. There are real security risks, um, but sort of demonizing a lot of uh, Chinese students, Chinese international students, um, and gutting a lot of the sort of bread and butter of the American scientific enterprise. Um, and, you know, I'm not, I'm not based in those countries, but I think they're, they maybe have as much of an opportunity as we have a challenge in the United States uh, in that maybe some of the uh, trends of brain drain might be disrupted. Um, during this period. And I, I don't know what that will mean for places like China and India. Um, but I, you know, it's certainly an interesting thing to think about. Um, I have also thought about the, the sort of infrastructures that are often invisible that make um, science possible. Um, that can be, you know, literal physical infrastructure like, you know, telescopes and particle colliders and, you know, all of these, these this machinery that um, is required to to push science forward that uh, gets affected by by major disruptions in ways that you may not think about when you initially think about science and the disruptions to science um, and those have really come to the fore and a lot of you know university based organizations have been lobbying the United States Congress for extra sort of support. Um, to allow for recovery from that. Um, I think there's a lot to learn in terms of the way that, that we as leaders and we as the public think about, um, you know, what makes science tick and what makes science possible. Um, and we really, you know, there's an opportunity here to think of it as a social and political entity. Um, and I also wanted to touch on you know, the role of the Black Lives Matter movement. I think, you know, this moment has fo forced a reckoning in nearly every organization and sector. Uh, science and technology is no, um, no sort of stranger to that. Uh, there was, on June 10th, there was a movement to shut down STEM, and there were a lot of, um, and shut down academia, um, and many researchers kind of took a step back and, and had a day of reflection and protest and writing and, um, you know, whatever else, and self-educating, um, whatever else they were doing on that day. Um, and I think there has been, um, you know, a, a really strong kind of uh, reckoning of science as, as a political force and as a social force that is affected by, by racism um, and by sexism and by all of the, and colonialism and all of these other forces in a way that a lot of us were have been thinking about for a long time, but has only recently become part of the the, the mainstream conversation within the community. Um, and I think of that as um, as a as a real opportunity for us. Uh, and I'll close on that as 
um, a way to, to really think about what it would mean to have a compassionate, credible, feminine, scientific, decolonial, anti-racist version of the scientific enterprise. And that is, that's the biggest question that keeps me up at night and I have a, a, a renewed energy around it um, at this time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wow, what a wonderful panel that we've had. We've had a, a viewpoint from just about all perspective, education, philosophy, technology, investment, health, and everything else. It's been really, really great uh, chatting to all of you. And uh, now I will uh, pass the, the floor on to Rovshan, who will have some concluding remarks for all of us. Thank you again so much for having me game to part to actually, uh, you know, uh, give us your, your point of view. And I think the future is not so dark after listening to all the young people that we had on this panel today. Thank you so much. Ravshan, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you for so much for your dedication and for your time. And uh, Dave and, and Yves Kamu for, for time and like, you know, for inspiration of us making this happen. But I have like, you know, uh, short remarks. And also I think that it's going to be a last question like, you know, everyone can answer. Uh, as today, uh, tomorrow, tomorrow we are going to have a uh, conference uh, where Ms. Kerry Kennedy is speaking, the daughter of Robert F. Kennedy, and uh, it's almost 60 decades before like, Madam President was giving her video uh, message to, to the anniversary. But 60 decades ago, Martin Luther King and uh, Robert F. Kennedy were being uh, assassinated. What didn't change? It's the same issue, it's the same problems. Black Lives Matter, I mean like, you know, it's been like six decades ago, five decades ago, four decades ago, we still have like, you know, the same problems and still it continues in America. And also about racism, definitely in America and uh, we have a racism and in the entire world we have a racism how we young people are going to be able to, to stop it. What, what, what's the role a young people are going to have it on that? Because each of us are having a position, a responsibility, or we are leading some institutions. Another issue like, uh, the leadership issue, like why, what, what's happening in the United States of America? Because What we never had in Obama administration, in the Bush administration, in Clinton administration, we are now having. What, 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 what's stopping is the young leaders. I use, you know, like Dave, like Emma Scandal, like John and Newton and Swati, you know, just to go to vote. And what, what's the problem? Because why everyone is like, you know, facing up to the same crisis questions? Uh, in a, during this pandemic situation. And uh, why we are like also playing, uh, because Dave studied, uh, and I think Rachel also, studied in Tsinghua University. And uh, after that, I think that, you know, China and America is like, you know, a bad marriage. The universe can be able to stop this, like, you know, relationship. Why we are like, you know, playing a game, like a blaming game, like between the countries, but we are still like a political situation is, is becoming to be a bad and bad. Just maybe everyone can give like, you know, a quick response. What do you think about Black Lives Matter issue? Because I think that that was our biggest disastrous issue. So I think I, I'm, I'm happy to sort of start start that conversation off. I think you mentioned that this is something that that's that is been ongoing, but also relatively new. I, I think it's important to, to contextualize that the Black Lives Matter movement actually started under Obama's presidency um, as a direct uh, relationship or in, in contradiction to the idea of American exceptionalism in which you know, black people can occupy some of the, the highest rungs of society and lead the country, yet cannot be served justice in their own communities. And I think it was that dichotomy um, that really galvanized a group of people after the death of Trayvon Martin, who was killed at the hands of George Zimmerman, and Eric Garner, who also uh, 
was killed by by police officers in New York, that that people really started to to say that you know if we as as an individual or, or we as as a people can 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 be the president, but but can't actually you know be 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 served justice in, in our own streets, then 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 this this isn't this isn't right. This isn't fair. Um, and I, and I think that th that uh, <laughs> there there's a long history. I think uh, what what the United States is really good at, and, and one of our best traits as Americans, and I say this as American, is is our ability to revise history. Um, and there is a constant revision um, of our history to make it fit with our morals and and our values of the day. And I think that the issue of race in the United States was never adequately addressed. Um, it was just repackaged and resold. This is by, again, the, the, the people who, who hold power and who are the majority have been repackaged and, and, and reselling these, these stories and, and have refused to, to sort of have those, those conversations. I think that if you asked most people who are, who are Black in the United States about their, their perception of, of, of police brutality or equal justice in front of, of, of the law will tell you and can give you specific examples of, of, of when that has failed. I, I mean, many of us have listen, listened to rap songs. I, I think, you know, the calls to, uh, about police brutality have, have, have been very prevalent and clear there for, for as long as hip hop has been along. I've been around, and, and so I think that this notion that that this call is 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 new or different is is I I, I think a little bit misguided. I, I think what is different is the circumstances by which people are seeing them. Um, people oftentimes say the revolution will not be televised, but the re the revolution is being filmed and it's being shared, um, and it's not on these mass um, sort of corporate media accounts that, that, that we're seeing, but rather by individuals in their own hometowns, sort of taking photos and videos of, of, of the injustices that they see on a regular basis. And it's that coupled with the fact that I think in this, the time of coronavirus, everyone is, is, is tethered to their, their screen. Um, that's really drawing a lot of attention to this. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there and let someone else pick up on it. Yeah, I, uh, I can add a, a couple of comments. Thank you, Newton, for, for your comments. Um, I, I think this is a, a moment in which, you know, the, a lot of these concerns obviously have been ongoing. The problems obviously have been ongoing for a very long period of time. And I think this is a moment where a lot of people who, who have the privilege of not having to think about these things on a daily basis are reckoning with the fact that we actually need real transformative and not aesthetic changes. And I think a great example of this is, I, you know, I live in Washington, D.C. Um, our mayor, Muriel Bowser, was sort of lauded in, in national media for the, uh, the Black Lives Matter mural in front of the White House. I'm sure a lot of you saw that um, on the news. Um, and, you know, a couple days later went on a uh, in local news and, and said she wouldn't even consider, you know, rethinking the approach to policing in DC or, or defunding police and moving resources to, to communities. Um, and I think there's a lot of frustration among obviously the black and brown communities in the US, but, you know, broader coalitions of, of um, largely young people um, who are, are seeing the failures of, of aesthetic change uh, and not real transformational change. Um, and I think, uh, at least in my lifetime for the first time, I'm, I'm hearing a lot more mainstream calls for defunding and abolition of the police, for radical changes in police accountability, for radical changes in um, the way that we think about the role of police in our society. Um, and I think, you know, the, the Black Lives Matter movement obviously has, has been on the scene since the Obama years, as Newton pointed out. Um, but a lot of the, the, the threads that were picked up from that were often around other aspects of reform, like body cameras and, and, uh, and other things. And I think um, more and more we're hearing about the, the transformational change that is, that is needed to actually lay bare um, the, the issues around race and the way that they've been institutionalized, not only into policing, but into every other type of institution, as many of us have, have talked about today. Um, and 
you know, I for one have been thinking a lot about the way that we memorialize um, scientists. You know, we're, we're talking about monuments, the, <laughs> the Confederate monuments that are being torn down in sort of the political sphere. Um, but I think we do that and we, we tell these stories of, of heroes who are scientists um, and without really stopping to consider, A, all of the other infrastructures and people who made their successes possible, but B, you know, what, what counter effects those, those uh, findings had on black and brown communities, um, other marginalized communities. Um, so I think it's a, a, a real moment of opportunity and a real moment of reckoning. Um, thank you, Swati. I'll just quickly come in, uh, Ravshan, just to pick up to what Swati has just mentioned. Um, I think over and above the reform of the police, I'm, I'm just looking at it from, very, from, from afar, because I'm out in Mauritius and of course the US is very far, but I think this is what is resonating now in Britain. It's resonating in everywhere where the, of course uh, there, there has been of course migration of, of blacks from Africa to, to, to what we call increasing the diaspora. Uh, over and above the reform, over and above, you know, all that is coming out of, of the media now in terms of the reform of the police or defunding of the police and all the rest of it. But one thing that you have said, Swati, which is very true, to what extent do we write the history of the contribution of the black community, be it in the sciences, be it every, in any other sphere? And I think this is what I was alluding to earlier on when I was mentioning about the Black Lives Matter movement in terms of educating the black youth of the contribution of their folks into the development of, of you know, science, development of all spheres of society where there has been contribution of the black movement of, of the black people but unfortunately this contribution has been repackaged and uh, sold differently and i don't think that many uh, black community anywhere else not just in the united states they really know the history of the black people when they left africa and this is something that has to be written down and written in the proper you know credible way so as to really put the right light on the contribution of these people since they left the continent over to where they have made significant contribution. Not enough is spoken about, not enough history has been written down properly because you know history is never written by the victims. History is always written by the conquerors. So I think this is something that we have to actually interiorize, that we really have to repackage history, but properly so that the kids get a true narrative of I think that there, uh, just to, as a response to that, I think there has been a very concerted effort um, on the part of many members of the African American community to to think about reclaiming history. I, I mean, February um, is Black History Month, and I, I, I have have heard my fair share of stories about inventors and scientists and um, astronauts and individuals who have made a huge impact on society uh, throughout my upbringing through through those channels. What I will say is that oftentimes in the grand scheme of those things, I think that you know, black people are well aware of, of their history and how that is connected to a larger American sort of history. But I, and even in the diaspora, I, I think that there, there are many people, uh, if you look at you know, the Caribbean or even in Europe who, who have a really good understanding of, of, of how their histories intertwine with, with what may be sort of the dominant historical narrative. But I think the issue is that the majority has not taken the time to learn learn those things, right? And, and, and it's not that, again, I, I said this before, if you ask black people about police brutality, you know, they will tell you and they will have, the, the, the message that you get in 2020 is the same message that you would have gotten in 2000, is the same message that you would have gotten in 1960, and nothing has changed. And it hasn't changed not because black people haven't said anything, it hasn't changed because white people have not taken the time to learn and to learn the history that they have, have you know, participated in erasing and being able to apply that and think about the way that English changes need to happen. And one of my fears and one of the things that keeps me up at night, you know, I just went to Amazon, my Amazon account, uh, which was for AWS for 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 one of my my um, my, uh, my my servers and I, on the front page is a Black Lives Matter sticker and while I really appreciate Amazon you know telling me that they value Black lives I really want Amazon to value Black lives that work in the factories and work in the warehouses where people have COVID and there are Black people who are fighting on the front lines fighting for for access to PPE for access to, to, to materials that can help them better do their job, but also be safe. 
I don't want stickers, right? And this is me speaking personally. I don't want stickers. I want action. And I think Swati was talk talking a lot about this before. I think we've seen in the United States, and, and, I, and I said this in the top of my, my conversation, is that what we're really good at is, is revising history. And what we see happen time and time again is that these stories get co-opted and they get twisted and turned. You know, now we look at Martin Luther King as this, this person who was loved and, and beloved by all. But in the time, you know, he, he, he was stalked and, and profiled by the police as a, a menace to society. And, and, you know, here we are 60s years later going back being like, everyone loved him. We all sang Kumbaya. No, he was a dissident. He was a radical. Like he was assassinated for his beliefs. Um, yet... You know, the story that we tell ourselves in the United States is, is, is not well, that. So I think, precisely, yeah, this is precisely so, the kind of narrative we have to bring out. Exactly. And this is why we need to keep on telling the true stories. And uh, so it's very, very important to, to do that. Thank you very much for, for you know, highlighting this. So it's been a fascinating uh, discussion, and I, I'm sure we could go on and on. I'm sure Rofshan wouldn't mind holding a second edition so that we can touch on some of the issues that we have raised, which have remained unanswered. But globally, it's been a fantastic ex exchange. And I really think, thank you all of you uh, for having taken time uh, to be part of this panel. And Rofshan, thank you again for putting it all together. And as usual, very professionally done, quickly, but uh, done, of course, with great care and good attention. Thank you so much, Rofshan. And uh, have a great evening or day for me this evening. And uh, hope to see you soon in Baku. Cheers. <laughs>